Run it up, then run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Good Wednesday morning and welcome to Run It Back right here on FanDuel TV. <laughs> yep, over here. We are ready. Sham Sharani is working on something right now. He'll join us in a second. Introducing the guys, Chandler Parsons, Lou Will. Chandler, we haven't seen you since Super Bowl. How was it? My God. I, I, I don't sound <laughs> I don't I don't sound quite like you, Michelle. I hope you're I hope you're feeling better, but Listen, seven seven days in Vegas is is offensive, and it's it's too much. And it was a blast, and the game obviously went well. Chiefs won, um, but yeah, I'm I'm beat up, I'm defeated, and I don't feel good at all. I can't believe you made it seven days. I didn't even do anything, and I came back sick as a dog. You actually lived life, and I don't know how you're standing at all. Good for what you. What really hurt me is the first couple of days, I was like, oh, I'm just going to ease into it. We got our show, we're recording. Uh, that, that didn't happen. I was out till three, four in the morning gambling every single night. So that was supposed to be my rest leading up to the big weekend when everybody mm -hmm. got there. My wife got there. By the time my wife got there on Friday night, I was shot. I, I had <laughs> nothing left to give. And I and I, I fought through, but it was... It was a blast. Trav hooked us up with a really good suite during the game. We were right there on the field. Um, and yeah, it was all, uh, it's just despicable. It's a despicable town. It's a despicable <laughs> weekend. And I still, I'm still paying the piper. It's unbelievable how bad I felt 72 hours after. Aren't you glad I was sick yesterday? I bought you Oh my time. God. When I got that text, <laughs> I was stoked. We all were glad you were sick yesterday. We much got, appreciate it. Yeah, my immune system's got you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to get to some basketball. Actually, some some fun games last night we could talk about. We're going to start with little Kings, Suns, uh, Katie and Booker, of course, leading their team, 130-125. Sabonis, so though, 35 points, 18 rebounds, 12 assists. His mm -hmm. third straight triple-double, 18th this season. He leads the league, by the way. He's got three over Jokic. Fox finished with 49-6. and six. Um, there is a play, though, however, Chandler, that you wanted to talk about, specifically the Suns being up 124-121. Yeah, well, I'm watching this play at the end of the game, and I'm surprised that the Kings bench didn't go more nuts because this right there is a clear and one. Any, anyway, throughout the game, unless this is the end of the game right here, the refs have been consistent on calling this a foul. And, and Book leaves his feet. He's in the air. And this changes the whole dynamic of the game. Now Sabonis goes to the line and he has a chance to tie this game up. And then we know what inevitably happened where I think the next play, there was a foul called on the Kings but before the ball was inbounded. So now another free throw. Um, and then they got another uh, a foul and, 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 and Book made the free throw, missed one. Royce O'Neal had a huge tip out. But this was a critical play in the game where that's a foul. And I know one play doesn't determine the outcome of a game, but... I, I guess you can't review this. I don't know. I don't because there wasn't the, the whistle wasn't blown, but they got the raw end of the deal here a lot towards the end of the game here. And they put themselves in position to, to win this game. Uh, but credit to the Suns. They made some plays down the end of the stretch that that offensive rebound on the free throw line from Royce O'Neal was big. KD had a big game book, made some big shots. Grace now made some shots, but that play right there, I'm watching the game. Like, man, that that's a, that's a game changing call right there. That was Clearly missed. I feel like the Knicks would tell you one play can affect uh, the outcome <laughs> of a game. Lou, did you, Lou, you're really big on, was there a foul? There's not a foul. What did you think of that play? You agree with Chandler? Yeah, that was absolutely a foul. And, and like Chandler said, you would just like to see com some consistency with the way games are being officiated now, especially when you come down right after that um, and, and call a foul before the ball is inbounded. Those are those are the type of things that make a player lose his mind and gets kicked out of a game because you know you swear that you're not getting the the the, the fair end of the deal and and especially in a close game like that where that makes so much of a difference in how um, the outcome of the game goes. That that's just that was a ridiculous no call. Referee was right there in front of it. That's a textbook one. You know when I played, I used, I had a saying with the referees: Hey, at least at least call the easy. You know, so that way when 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 the game gets down to it, to the nitty gritty, you know, we can show you a little leeway and, and be a little bit more patient with you missing something. But those right there, you got to have it. That's 100 percent a foul. 
Man, refs having a week right now. Uh, the Suns right now, four of their last five victorious, four games back of the fourth spot in the West, Lou. Um, we weren't really sure what to make of this team. They made some moves. We thought, okay, this will be it. Do they have enough to get in the four spot, in your opinion? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no. I think I think they're okay. gonna stay right there in that fifth that fifth to sixth um, spot right there. My damn earpiece fell out. But um, <laughs> right now we're looking at them. We're looking at them four games behind uh, that four spot. I don't see Denver letting up. I don't see the Clippers letting up. Um, the Young Guns, the OKCs, and and wow. the Minnesotas. They've been consistent this entire season. You know we got to give them their proper respect. They're the real deal. They're here to stay. And so that four game gap. I don't see any of those teams going backwards. I see all of them trending up, coming out of the all-star break, ready to end up for a long postseason run. And especially with Brad Bill going out with, with a hamstring, you know, they've been consistently injured this year and only having two out of the three big guys on the, on the floor the majority of the season. I don't, I don't see them breaking that top four right now. It's crazy that we're saying OKC and Minnesota will stay in the top. I did not think we would be here right now. Did you, Chandler? No, I definitely didn't think <laughs> it's Minnesota. Weird. Minnesota, to me, is the sleeper team all season long. I, I expected OKC to kind of make this jump. You expected the Clippers, the Nuggets, these teams to be in the hunt. Minnesota, to me, has been the surprise team. But I'll tell you this, whoever is going to finish in that three or four, whether it's you know the Clippers, OKC, Denver, they're not going to want to play the Phoenix Suns first round. So whoever does have that, that gap right there, they're going to try and figure out a way towards the end of the season to how do we get New Orleans? How do we get Dallas? Because if Bradley Beal is healthy and this big three is healthy and they add guys, a guy like Royce O'Neal, who you already saw him make his impact last night by making threes, hustle plays, offensive rebounds. This team is going to be complete and this team is going to be well come postseason time. So hopefully this hamstring is nothing, nothing serious with Bradley Beal. Um, but this was a team that I had high hopes for. I had high expectations, obviously, with all the talent. Health was always going to be a question with them and the Clippers. The Clippers have been healthier. They're having a better season. But come postseason, I don't want to play these guys first round. That's for damn sure. Well, we've had a couple mentions of Bradley Beal. He, of course, got hurt. Shams, welcome. Uh, what is the latest on Bradley Beal? It's a left hamstring injury. He had the same hamstring earlier in the season, and he will not play tonight. They had a back-to-back. -back. He's not going to go tonight, and he's going he's gonna to rest until after the All-Star break. They play again February 22nd. They're hopeful that they're going to be able to use the entire All-Star break, have him ready to go. But, I mean, it's definitely a concern. He's dealt with, with the back issue. Obviously, we've discussed that length. Hamstring. He, has, he had an ankle injury as well. So across the season already, through the first half, there's been multiple different injuries that have, that have kept him out. And that is a concern for the Suns. Yeah, that's it's he seems to be a little bit cursed with the injury bug. Um, okay, Kings, Chandler, let's concentrate in the eighth spot right now. I think they want to just do enough to get past the play in. Do you think they have enough to do so? I do, and I, and I think they're a solid team, I think they're a complete team. They have a lot of different lineups they can go to, and when I'm watching Sabonis, I don't want this taken out of context because he's not Jokic. But goddamn, he is close. This guy, <laughs> he, he, he's unbelievable. The way he gets these triple doubles, if we, when, when Jokic did it, we talked about it every day. When Westbrook did it, we talked about it all the time. We're talking MVP conversations. This guy's doing it, you know, 17, 18 times. He's got a crazy streak of 30 and 10. The way he uses his body and creates space and gets offensive rebounds and tips the ball to himself and kind of gets those rebounds <clears throat> And brings it up the floor like a point guard. He plays very, very similar to a Jokic. And he's an unbelievable talent. He's continued to get a lot better. So you mix him with a dynamic guard like Fox. And if you can keep getting things from Murray, from, from you know, from Herder and guys like this, this team is solid and they are balanced. But you got to give Sabonis his flowers. We do not talk about them. He got snubbed on the all-star team. Him and Fox both deserve to be in there. Because uh, their team wins, they play the right way, they play on both sides of the ball, and this dude's putting up gaudy numbers. I mean, the 35, 18, and 12, that we're getting numb to this. That's an outrageous stat line. That's a great point, Lou. Are we getting numb to this? Are we just spoiled as fans that these numbers no longer have the kind of meaning they once did? It's a lot. It, it, it's a lot, and I think you're seeing, you're seeing a mix of defense not being played, uh, 
that's how the league is structured. You know, we are in the sports entertainment business where, you know, we want to see high scores. And, and then we also are seeing some of the most talented guys that you've ever seen. Some of the most um, or, uh, orthodox style of play that you've ever seen with so many bigs playing like guards and, you know, so many guards changing their games to to do things in the, in the stat realm of, you know, the NBA. And so I, I think we're definitely getting numb to it. But at the end of the day, it's very entertaining. And you're seeing it from guys that you're supposed to see it from. You know, the superstars are being superstars. The all-stars are being all-stars. Even the guys that are getting snubbed, the, you know, the Foxes, the Sabonises, they're even putting up gaudy numbers. So I think there's a surplus of, of talent, guys playing at a high level. I think the league is in a good place because of um, You know who's not in a good place? Segway. The Milwaukee Bucks. I uh, I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say about this because what in the world? Shorthanded Heat blow them out. 123.97. Bam Adebayo with 16, 12, and 11. His second triple double of the season, season seventh of his career. Nikola Jovic, a career high 24 points. Duncan Robinson with 23. Giannis did have 23, 11, and eight. Took zero free throws. Um, they lose by 26, and they're three and six in the Doc Rivers era Chandler I mean I knew it was a rough start but what is going on you know what's crazy is if, if we did the show yesterday I would have praised them how well they looked the night before against Denver <laughs> how inspired they looked defensively how Patrick Beverly just was thrown right into this lineup and fit right in and they were flying around they were switching they were diving on the floor they had that intensity on defense that I hadn't seen this year from Milwaukee and then fast forward 24 hours later, they were awful. And they they were reverted right back. They they didn't score the ball, which was shocking, but they they they, they had no effort. And this is a team where with the new coach, they're still kind of in this honeymoon phase. You can't see lapses like this. I don't care if it's on a, a second night of a back-to-back. -back. This is a team that you should beat. This is a team that's below you in the standings. It's a team that you might see in the postseason that you have something to prove to. So it's weird because I was so ready to praise them the day before on how, how much better they looked and the intensity that they played with. And then they go and do this and lay an absolute egg and get smacked by a team that they, they had no business getting smacked by. Let a guy Jovich go off for a career high, who by the way is a solid player and just another product of the Miami heat and development. I'm sure we'll talk about him later, <laughs> but yeah, this, this was crazy because I didn't see this coming from one game to the next. I'm a, you know what? I'm still going to give them credit. That, that The game before last, they were flying around. They looked like they were communicating on defense. I think this loss is a result of their offense. You know, I think they didn't play well on the offensive end. I think they've cleaned up some things defensively um, that they can hang their hat on that that's, that's going to make them a better team in the long run. But I think this is an offensive problem. So, like, I agree with you, Chandler. They look they look very motivated and confident on the defensive end the game before last. And I was uh, that was something I was looking forward to giving them praise on. But this game, like I said, I think this was an offensive issue. Yeah, and here's the thing. Like the game against Denver, they go up 44 points in the first half. They go up 95 points in the game. If they do that, their offense doesn't have to be so elite because they can still find uh, ways to win games. But when they're both not clicking and you're not defending, you're giving up back to 123, 130 points a game, and then you're struggling offensively, you're going to really, really struggle, and it's going to be hard to win games. So they have to find some sort of balance where they can create offensive mismatches on that end. But then they also – they should – they're talented enough to be able to win games even when they don't have these explosive offensive games. Lou, you talked about the defense. You've seen some improvement. What, what has been the biggest change since Doc got there that you've noticed? He's still putting in his system, still getting guys in the, in the right place. One thing I can credit Doc for that I experienced in my career, he's a specialist at making sure guys that, that aren't really great on a defensive end, he's going to put them in positions to be successful. He's going to just make sure they're in the right place, putting in his team defense okay. concepts with all of these guys. And I saw, you know, he was mixing up different lineups. He had a lineup of Jay Crowder, Pat Bev. Uh, Chris Middleton, Giannis, and 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 one and the Lo uh, Brook Lopez, and that was a really good group for them on the defensive end, and they had enough uh, scoring power as well to lead them over. And I thought that was a really good group for them. And so they're starting to address some of those issues for for the long run. And I think Doc is still early. Listen, this team had their issues before Doc, and I, I mentioned that earlier. When you bring in a coach like that, when you bring in um, such a polarizing coach that has 
you know, such a reputation in the, in the league, that's going to put a target on you, you know? And so some of these things that they had issues with before he was the coach, he's trying to patch them up on the fly and he's getting some criticism for it because of the rough start. But I still think, you know, they have time to clean these things up. All right. Just a reminder, Miami was shorthanded, Shams. You got Terry Rozier, Josh Richardson, both out. What's the latest on both of them? Terry Rozier's injury was definitely the most uh, scary for the Heat. And thankfully for them, he was diagnosed with a sprained knee uh, on Monday. He's week to week. My sense is after the All-Star break, there's potential for him to return pretty quickly. Josh Richardson, though, he's been coming off the bench, averaging 10 points a game, shooting 40% from three the last couple months. He has a dislocated shoulder. He's going to be out at least a few weeks before he's going to be reevaluated. Um, and also, they're without Jimmy Butler. And he lost a very close family member recently. And he's going to spend time away from the team. They've, been, they, they've granted him a leave of absence. It could be an extended period of time for Jimmy Butler. Obviously, we wish him the best and, and we wish him uh, prayers uh, for, for, his, for his family and, and their loss. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tough situation, whatever that might be. Um, the Terry Rozier of it all, 12 and a half points a game with Miami, but now the knee injury will keep him out for a while. I mean, look, they won this game easily, Chandler, but in the long term, how big a deal is this? Well, I think the the fact that it's not a serious injury and All-Star Weekend coming up here, that's that's a huge bonus. The injuries like this and to Bradley Beal, they basically get a free week to, to now heal. Um and to, to kind of focus on just doing nothing but being ready by the time All-Star Weekend's over. But, yeah, this guy, he struggled a little bit. You can see he's pressing. He's taking a lot of long mid-range jumpers. But I do think for what they gave up, I think this is going to end up being a positive. This is a team that's going to make a run in the postseason. This team, hopefully, if they're fully healthy, he can really, really help that second, whether you're starting or second unit, he's a bucket. He can be a closer for you. Uh, if guys like Jimmy or Bam are having an off night, this is a guy that can go and get you 25, 30 points. So his numbers have been inconsistent. He's been a little streaky since he's been there, but it's a new situation. It's a new offense. It's a whole new culture. He even said it's, it's a <laughs> different feeling losing here than it was in Charlotte. Um, no doubt, I think he gets his his rhythm uh, post All Star break, and this turns out to be a great trade for them. We got an, the next game is just the game that reminds us all that we're getting older because there's so much youth on the floor in this one. Thunder and Magic, OKC with the win, one twenty seven, one thirteen. They're only a half game behind the T Wolves right now for that top spot out west. Jalen Williams finished with thirty three. SGA had thirty two. Jalen Williams back to back games with at least thirty. Um, he's been fun to sort of watch emerge. This is only his second season, Chandler. What have you noticed about his game? Yeah, everything. He's just gotten better <laughs> on, on every aspect. He's obviously SGA has become this, you know, top five player, uh, top two in MVP voting. And, and I think he's kind of making a real push to, to win MVP this year. But when you look at this kid's numbers and what he does, particularly in the fourth quarter, He's kind of their closer, and he's such a big body. He's a big guard. He gets to his spots. You can't really f speed him up. Uh, he's a capable shooter. Uh, I think he, when he continues to get more consistent from the three-point line, he's gonna it's going to open up his game even more. But he gets to the rim. He gets to the foul line. He defends. He's a lot bigger than you think when you see him in person. This is another kid that we're going to be talking about probably as soon as next year, you know, being an all-star, being a top 20, 25 mm. player. So... This team is loaded. We talk about it all the time. They have, you know, it's not just SGA. It's not just it's not just Jalen Williams. They have six to eight kids that are 23 <laughs> years old or younger that are absolute studs that would start on pretty much every other team in the NBA. So, uh, you know, kudos to them. They, they haven't really gone through the rebuilding process. They've just got all these assets, all these players, and to be in the number one spot or flirting with it, uh, it's truly really incredible. Obviously, the rise of SGA has, you know, made that monumental. But now this kid, Jalen Williams, coming out of nowhere, he's a stud too. He's he's the Jalen Brown to the Jason Tatum of the future of this team. Here we are. Look, the 2022 draft that was a fun draft because up until the last second, things seemed to be moving around, Lou. But this the first or second meeting between the one and two picks. You have Paolo. You have Chet. All things considered, would you have switched? the way they were drafted or are you good with how it went down? I'm good with the way it is. You know, Paolo is, is obviously proven himself to be a number one guy. He's an all-star this year. He's a first time all-star, very much earned. You know, let's think about how the Orlando Magic started this season. They were on fire and a lot of that was because of him and the way that he played and 
and the position that he put him in with his leadership and just being a young player and putting him on his back. And, and Chet is also emerging as, you know, exactly who we thought he was. You know, he's possibly the rookie of the year this year. Um, if, if, if not, if something miraculous happens with Wimby, huh. I think he's still, huh. I think he's still the leader, even though Wimby is playing out of his mind basketball right now, give him credit. But I think you stand pat and, and Paulo deserves his number one and Chet deserves his number two. I noticed you said possibly rookie of the year. We'll, we'll come back to that. Put a pin in it. Um, last night, there were some fun festivities as the Magic retired Shaq's jersey. Uh, he said it would probably be the most impressive one because he knew that LSU and the Lakers would retire his jersey. Chandler, you believe that? Oh, his suit. No, I think that, as an Orlando kid, you know, going to this game at Amway with my grandpa and those pinstripe jerseys, Shaq was oh. everything to this city. And he, and he wasn't... He wasn't there very long, and he left us and broke our hearts to the, to the Lakers. But <laughs> this dude was dominant, man. He averaged like 24-15 his rookie season. Uh, he took us to the finals. Remember, he led the NBA in scoring his second or third year, was second the other year. Uh, it was an electric, you know, uh, you know, run there with Orlando, and he deserves this. And, and, and he took us all the way to the finals against Houston and those were the years. Those are still my favorite teams with him and Penny, Nick Anderson, Horace Grant. Uh, they had the city on fire, and this is much deserved because the minute he walked in, uh, you know, he, he was so great. He's such a big personality. Everything he does, um, you know, is just he's so charismatic, and the city just got really got behind him. So this this is much deserved, and and this should have happened a, a really long time ago because Shaq's the man. Shaq's the man. Lou, you got any memories you want to share? All things considered, I think we got we to gotta realize at that time, Shaq was a successful rapper. He was a <laughs> successful movie star. Huh. Orlando was a brand new franchise trying to, trying to get off the ground. And Shaq did everything that he possibly could to shine a huge spotlight on the city of Orlando and made them take them serious as a basketball town, along with Penny Hardaway. Nick Anderson, even Bo Outlaw was one of my was one of my fan favorites at that time. And so this oh, wow. is very oh. much deserved. Yeah, yeah, this is this <laughs> is very much deserved for Shaq. I would agree with him that this was the most impressive because, you know, you just wasn't sure. And so much time has gone by, you know, but to put a, a spotlight on Orlando Magic basketball, Shaquille O'Neal did that. And so very much deserved. You've been on the floor with him against him. What's that like? It's uh, it's actually pretty scary. I, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> He's uh, one of the one of the tallest, biggest humans I've ever seen in my life, and um, I've had the pleasure of getting fouled by him um, a few times, a little harder than I would I would like to appreciate. But you know, that's that's what stories are made of. That's what legends are made of. So, you know, I can grow old and tell my kids I played against Shaquille O'Neal, and he sacked the hell out of me a few times. Um, and and that's, that was an exciting time in my career to even share the floor with him. I, I love that. Especially if you're close enough, you realize how huge he really is as a human being. All right, we'll take a quick look around the league. Um, first story, duh. Wemby had on Monday night a triple-double with blocks against the Raptors. He finished with 27, wow. 14, and 10. And he did it all in 29 minutes. Gentlemen your last chance to jump on the bandwagon with me rookie of the year uh, right now he's a, a runaway favorite uh, there's room listen i i listen he's playing well enough to win rookie of the year we just gotta we gotta find middle ground with with the criteria what do we respect about these awards is it winning mm -hmm. is it numbers is it a combination of both does different guys have their own set of rules because He's doing some historical, incredible things. However, it hadn't moved the needle. They're still in dead last in the West. And so we got to understand that, yes, he's a young player and they're in a rebuild and they're going to put talent around him in the future. But at present, at this present moment, you have a guy that doesn't have the numbers that's as gaudy as his, but he's playing better basketball on a better basketball team. And he's the number two guy, you know, in, in the second in the second place team in the West that can possibly finish this season in a number one spot. So we just got to figure out what the criteria is and what do we respect about these awards? Because if it's just numbers, if that's the criteria, then Wimby should be the rookie of the year. But if we're talking about the totality of everything, it should go to Chet. Yeah, I got, I got some numbers here. And listen, you can't go wrong either way. Wimby is more of a crazy talent. Like if I see both of them are playing, 
I'm going to the Spurs game because I'd rather watch him play. The shit he does is out of this world. <laughs> the, the triple doubles with the 10 blocks, it's nuts. Like he does things on a basketball floor I, I've never seen anybody do. But we're talking about the numbers here, right? Wimby's averaging 20, 10, three assists, and three and a half blocks in 29 minutes, which is nuts. 47 from the field, 32 from the from the three. Okay, they're 11 and 43. They're dead last in the conference, which to me, that matters because you're not going to give the MVP to someone dead last. You're not going to even give the all-star uh, vote to someone dead last. You look at Chet, 17 points a game. It's only three less. Eight rebounds. It's only two less. 2.6 blocks. It's only one block less. And the same amount of assists with a way better field goal percentage at 54% and a way better three-point percentage at 40%. And they're a half game out of first place in the same exact conference against the same exact teams that they're playing with a younger, just as young of a team. So when I'm looking at it, the the, the stat lines nightly from, from Wimby are crazy. And you see a triple-double like this where it's one game and it really is out of this world. But when you look at the landscape of everything they've both done, the stats aren't far off. The minutes aren't far off. He, Wimby plays 29 minutes a game. Chet plays 30 minutes a game. So he really only plays one more minute and is almost just as productive on a winning team. So to me, I think Wimby is going to be a better pro. I think he's going to, to be you know something we've never seen before. But the rookie of the year, to me, it's it's got to be a balance of winning. You're, you're looking at pretty similar stats on the best team against pretty similar stats on the worst team. I got to go with Chet still until until they win some more games. I don't accept this argument. I, <laughs> I, was, thinking of, I was thinking about you when I put that all together. Like, yeah, what's, I, know. What? I, I could see you going, okay, I've got some numbers here. I'll figure it out. Um, Shams, you watch a lot of basketball. What's the most impressive thing when you watch Wemby? So, Victor Wembanyama. To me, it's only a matter of time before he gets a quadruple double in a game. Four players in league history have had a quadruple double. Uh, two of them, David Robinson, Hakeem Olajuwon, they're all tied with one triple double, uh, a quadruple double, I should say. He already had a triple double the other night. He's he's shown he can he can do that. But the fact that he was he's able to get five assists, he can score, he can rebound, he can pass, he can block shots, he can play one through five. This whole season has been about natural progression for him. I think Chet, Chet Holmgren, you saw him come out the gates very strong. For Victor Wembanyama, it's been really a build-up all season. You've seen him play 30 minutes a few times over the last several weeks. And I, from my knowledge, he is eligible to get in, into the 30s. Is this about the games? Will the season dictate that? To me, it's only a matter of time. Could happen this year, could happen next year, that he gets that quadruple-double, that he potentially becomes the all-time leader in quadruple-doubles. And like we have the triple-double leaders, we could very <laughs> much have a Victor Wembanyama history setting for quadruple doubles because he can Quadru very much do it very soon. That sounds That's silly. And still not win rookie of the year. <laughs> He's going to win rookie of the year. I just, I know he is. I, you can't punish a rookie just because the team around him isn't as good as the other guys. Ooh. That's silly. He's better. You can't. You can when one team is a legit contender and one team is literally looking at the number one pick again. Like, it's like, of course you're going to put up good numbers. Your team stinks. Nope. Still you don't play accept money. it. <laughs> I don't accept it at all. I think, I, I think what he does is just much more impressive, but I also am a homer and I recognize that. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie in his new home. You know, he played. Six points, seven assists, four turnovers. He had 31 minutes off the bench. They did win the game over Detroit. Um, but, you know, it's hard to tell on the first one. Chandler, how do you like his fit, or how do you think you will like his fit with the Lakers? I think I will like it more than this debut. I think, first of all, <laughs> this is a great game to come back to, a home game against the Pistons. Uh, but when you look at this team, uh, th he's going to be their guy off the bench. Until Gabe Vincent gets healthy and – uh, you know, guys like Cam Reddish and Vanderbilt, we don't know what their starting lineup's going to be. But if it's this starting lineup with D'Lo and Reeves, then what he's the guy. He's the guy to go get you 20 off the bench. He's going to be that you know, ball in his hands, playmaking guard uh, that can score in multiple ways. So I do like the fit. Does he move the needle to them to, you know, to for me to be like, whoa, like they got a lot better? 
No, but but I do think he gives them more depth. I think he gives them more shooting, which any team can can need. And depending on how this final shakeup of their starting lineup, do they move D'Lo back to the bench? Does Reeves come to the bench? Do they go back to Cam Reddish in the starting lineup and bring Gabe Vincent as a real point guard uh, in the starting lineup? We'll see. But as this lineup last night, I think he'll have a lot of success kind of being that sixth man uh, head of the snake in that second unit. He's got to take care of the ball. But is, this is his first game. It's not easy. Um, but I do like to pick up for them a lot. Lou? I don't know, man. <laughs> 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 I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I was excited about Spencer Dinwiddie joining this basketball team. That was a, that was a lackluster uh, first game out, first showing. What better team to go out and have an opportunity to get going against than uh, – I just didn't see it, but I agree with Chandler. He he's definitely going to bring some balance to that bench. He's capable of having big nights and having big games and giving them that offensive push they need. He's also going to sit down and guard as well. And so, does he move the needle for this basketball team? That's yet to be seen. I'm not sure, but he definitely gives them some depth, um, and they've corrected that problem. But uh, this debut was a little lackluster for me. It is a tough first night out, Shams. What was your biggest takeaway? I think what I saw is Spencer Dinwiddie trying to figure out how he fits in. This is the Lakers team obviously playing well. They, they really beat up on the Pistons last night. The game wasn't really ever close. And so you saw a guy that's, to me, trying to fit, fit in and find a spot, played as a facilitator, seven assists off the bench. You saw his chemistry with Christian Wood, Wood and with Rui Hachimura. And, and I think long-term, the fact that he's played with D'Angelo Russell, Torian Prince, Rui Hachimura, Christian Wood, I think that does bode well for him. Uh, but like Lou said, you know, you definitely want to see some more offensive pop. But I think over time, you, you could see him, uh, you know, after the five to ten game sample size, that's when we're, to me, going to know exactly where he fits and what kind of impact can be made. That seems more fair. Five to ten games, not the first one. That was a, that was a tough one out. We're going to take a quick break right here. I mean, here. they only got about when, 30 left. I know. I was going to say, you got maybe five. We'll give five. <laughs> when we come back, some Sham scoops and... That man has a family. Run it back, Turk. Run it back. Yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. That sound. It's time to hear from Shams. Let's talk a little PJ Tucker. I, I know there's some frustration where he's involved. Shams, do you have the latest on that? PJ Tucker is now away from the Clippers, and he will. Re it's expected he's going to rejoin the team after the All Star break. Sources tell me, but. This has been months of frustrations. Three months he has not played in a single game. And the Clippers and Tucker this week, I'm told, have had productive conversations to figure out a path forward and potentially a role for him in the second half of the season and where he might fit in. He has not played since uh, November. And, and there's been moments uh, over the last several weeks, several months, where he has expressed his frustration publicly, privately. It's been boiling over. They needed to have these much uh, you know, needed conversations between Tucker, between the Clippers. There, there was no trade at the deadline. There's not going to be a buyout. He's got a contract player option for next season at about $11.5 million. So he's not going to let that go. The Clippers obviously are not going to waive that as well. So the, the sides needed to get on the same page this week. We'll see where that leads them after the All-Star break. But P.J. Tucker is now officially not going to be uh, around the Clippers until after the break. It's tough because the team's doing well, Lou, but the, and then you just see this, it's got to be frustrating. What's your reaction? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny situation. I've, I've, I've been in one particular um, when the team is doing well, but, you know, individually you're not in the position that you want to be in, and it's frustrating. You know, you want to be able to contribute. You want to be on the floor. You want to be part of the success and and feel like you're, you're earning your money and you're earning your keep, and P.J. Tucker is a very competitive person. You know, a lot of these guys would, would take their money and, and sit there and rot on the bench and, and be happy and, and fade off in the sunset, especially at 38 years old. P.J. is showing you that he's, he's still ready to compete. Um, he still wants to play and contribute. And so I, I, I can respect and appreciate that out of him. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't think about that. You could just sit and just get your money. I know I would. Uh, Chandler, what is your reaction? I did. I did, Michelle. I sat, I sat, I sat there and, and, and basically rotted and picked up a golf club. And that's, that was the rest was history. So, uh, listen, 
he he's healthy, which is different than I was. Oh shit! He, he, <laughs> feels, like, he uh he feels like he can help, but look, he's he's on arguably the deepest team in the in the NBA, and and when you look at their roster, there's a lot of guys that can do what he does that are even younger. Uh, but you know, again, he's got the player option. He's set to make a lot of money. They're not going to buy him out. He's not going to give up that bread unless he can get unless he can get some of it back somewhere else. But uh, you know, PJ Tucker has always been a versatile player. It's a utility player that can knock down the corner three. That can guard multiple positions. He just he's kind of in a situation right now where that's not needed. And like you said, the team is winning. They're having success. And so they don't think that they need to add anything different. He's feeling bad because he's not helping during any of the success. So it's 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 kind of goes both ways. But at the end of the day, he's in a he's in a pretty good situation. You're 38 yeah. years old. You're getting paid 11 million dollars. So, uh, take take it take it and uh, and take it straight to the bank. But I'm just, everybody wants more. So I've never seen a 38 year old like this want more. But, uh, you know, he, he can still probably contribute. And that's what and he knows that. So he, he wants to play. It's competitive inside. Um, all right, Shams, this I was watching this one live and I don't care for it at all. Uh, referee Ed Malloy from Monday night acknowledging that this foul that was called right here on Jalen yeah. Brunson against the Rockets was called incorrectly. What more can you tell us about how the league is handling this catastrophe? The Knicks. Yeah, the Knicks are filing, uh, uh, plan to file an official protest of the game. It, it was incorrect judgment call. And protests, to win a protest, you have to prove that there was a misapplication of a rule, that a rule was not applied correctly. Uh, but in, in, in the technicality of this, this was a judgment call. The referee made a judgment call of a foul. And so the chances of winning this protest, I'm not so sure about. The league, once they get this protest, they're going to take five days up to five days to make a, a determination on whether they're going to allow uh, the final play of the game in overtime to, to continue and, and to be played on. But uh, this was by the refs, by their own admission, they messed up the call. It was an incorrect call. Brutal. This thing was on its way to overtime, Lou. Nothing's going to happen. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. I, I, I've been on teams with countless amount of protests where we're in the practice facility <laughs> raising hell the next day trying to get tape into the league and the only thing you get back is our bad it was the incorrect Ugh. call and, and, and we're moving on nothing is going to change the outcome of this game um it's a tough it's a tough tough break for the for the new york knicks but nothing nothing is going to happen i think the league should take a look at these things and it's okay every once in a while for ed malloy uh to come out publicly and be held responsible and say i got this one wrong i think the fans would appreciate that more opposed to it being so quiet and so mysterious when referees screw up games. Huh. Yeah, I think I think there needs to be some, you know, override rule where if you see that this is incorrect, like get it right. And they saw this the moment that this play happened. Take 20 seconds, review it. Even I don't care if you're at a review, if you already wasted your review and you were wrong, like that's not right for the game to end this way. And and I love that Ed Malloy came out and admitted that it's wrong because the world can see it was wrong. And this could be the difference in the Knicks getting home court advantage or not getting home court advantage. And again, that's a little dramatic and it's just one play of a game and big long season, but this has been happening quite often. And there's a, and I know refs are humans, but they're getting it wrong. And we have so much science and technology to correct that. Like let's find a way to use that to make sure teams aren't going home pissed off and disgruntled because this was just a blown call, and there's no way with all the all the replay, all the sakakis, all the all the different you know guys watching this, just get it right. That's not that's not that much to ask for as a player, as a coach. Uh, you don't want to feel like your your team was slighted in any way, and we have the resources to do that. Do they get fined? Do refs get? Do, do, do they keep like a a record of each? You know, let's just say one ref in particular has a, a repeated habit of making these bad wrong calls are there fines they absolutely get, yeah they absolutely they get fined and reprimanded the problem is it's kept secret we you know the players and the fans we're not privy to the information but they hmm. they definitely get fined and reprimanded the way that you can tell you can see the way you can tell you can see which refs are in the playoffs and which aren't 
Fair enough. Right. Especially, yeah, the, the ones with a lot of experience. Oh, they, they should. I think it would help the refs, too, if they made that public. Because then it wouldn't feel like they're just getting away with these mistakes all, all the time. All our stuff is public. All our exactly. technical, all our comments. Why is the refs any different? Yeah, that that's interesting to me. Um, Shams, I appreciate you. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and you guys sticking around because we're doing that, man. Has a family. Uh, starting out with a little John Collins, if you will. Oh, hey. this is the first time I've seen John get up on that rim since he left Trey, man. It's good to see. I like Nobody throwing them lobs out there in Utah. <laughs> he always had the bounce. He had always had the bounce. He can fly. Nasir Little. Nasir is too little. Oh. Well, this is yeah, stupid. You gotta, you gotta get the... oh. no, that's pretty good. Again, everybody yeah. wants Wemby. Everybody you wants Little Wemby. It's body. Hey, little man. On the rookie of the year, rudder up. Hold that. Michelle, is, is that your king? <laughs> Michelle, I've seen show. enough. A white, a white man. A white man just dumped on him. <laughs> you know you can't what? say white like that in public, man. What is wrong with you? <laughs> ah, he's German. He's he's German. He's German. Oh, That's great. even worse. Oh, <laughs> God, I missed the highlight message with Taylor. Yeah, Taylor up, Hendrix. Hey, hey. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh dear. Double whammy, and I'm on the rim. <laughs> Was weird. By the way, this is the first. This is the rookie from UCF. Who I thought was going to be nice. This is the first time I'm hearing his name, and it's I, not. I was gonna just going to say that is the first time we've said his name on the show. I didn't even say it. Oh, you my did. God. <laughs> Welcome the to fella. the league, young fella. Bryce McGowns. Oh dear. He's Pete. Okay, uh, Bryce McGowan. <laughs> McGowans. McGowans. What's up? McGowan. What's up nice Bryce? to meet you, bud. <laughs> Okay, our yeah. next guy we've had a few times. Oh, yeah, I know oh, this guy. He lives in my building. Yeah, Oski. Yeah. But you know what? It's on, it's on a point card. Does it really count? Counts. Yeah, I like, counts I in like the end. this, man. You yeah, big O. Get off that ram, that boy. Oh, that man. That was slapped oh, all man. in his face. He leads the Same league in nosebleeds, too. This is okay. Oh my. Oh, man, that when was he does that, I'm in. Yeah. When he now, takes these ridiculous. bad shots, I hate it. But Left this. Hand. This. Oh my God! All of that. That's like something I would do on like an eight foot wow. rim. Oh my! Right. This is this is Fisher Price League right here. That's oh. silly. It's... Oops. We've hey, seen dude. that before. When he gets going left like that, that's what he usually takes off. It's kind of mean because all the kids like him, and now he got that going for you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the two hand too just knows he had no fear. You didn't see no. anybody there. Oh, just how disrespectful. <laughs> I'm going to say a two hand dunk in, in traffic is just disrespectful. I ain't worried about <laughs> none of y'all. <laughs> don't even oh. care. Or take a quick break. When we come back, a little you buying that featuring someone important. <laughs> that was great. Run it back returns. Run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it back, run it up, and run it back, run it back. Anybody sitting here looking at the Laker team and them talking about they can actually contest in the West for a title is <laughs> delusional. Okay. <laughs> Chandler, are you buying that? Uh, I thought he was going to go calm. But I mean. First of all, these guys say some of the craziest shit. That <laughs> it's really crazy. Delusional? No, but like is it realistic no like they're, they're, they're probably not going to win the west they're probably not going to be contenders can they get hot for a month and, and stay healthy and uh, their other teams get banged up and have some injuries and not go their way yeah but when, no when you look at the teams there's much better teams in the western conference there's much better teams in the eastern conference so i don't see them making a push they didn't really make big moves at the deadline to better their team i think spencer dinwiddie gives them a little bit more scoring. Um, but when you look at kind of everything going on in the NBA and all the teams, I, I just don't think they do have enough. So I, I, I'm i buying. I'm buying it, but, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I mean, you're kind of describing the word delusional, though, in fairness. It's kind of delusional. <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, right. it's, it's, anything can happen. It's the NBA, but I don't Fair. think it's not like it's not like they're saying the Pistons or the Wizards. It's not like it's not ridiculous. 
No, I know, but it, okay. Lou, uh, two mystery teams apparently believe that LeBron James will consider signing with them if they draft Bronny. Uh, are you buying that teams should consider drafting Bronny in the hopes that LeBron will follow? Yeah, I'm, I'm buying it. LeBron has said publicly over and over and over he's sticking around long enough to play with his son. So if I'm teams and I want to shout at LeBron James at 40 years old, 41 years <laughs> old, draft Bronny, you know, but I'm in agreement with Austin Rivers here, and I'm going to say this publicly. I think this is a bad idea. I want everything that Bronny gets. It should be deserved and it should be earned. If it's under the cloud of, in hopes of somebody's going to sign his father as well, this puts a little, this puts a different type of energy around him being drafted. I want to see him earn everything and get what he deserves and be respected as his own man. But I, I, think, I am buying okay. that if you draft him, you do get a shot at, at LeBron as well. Yeah, I feel uh, bad yeah. for him. By the way, I think there's going to be more than two teams. I think there's going to be like like 26 teams that are going to possibly <laughs> look at this. If they if, if the kid's available in the second round, like and you can get him and LeBron. Now, is someone going to waste a lottery pick? Ah, I don't know about that. But yeah, if, if, if the draft keeps going and... I've seen Mark Cuban draft Signop Singh out of India to do Dan Fagan a favor with the 60th pick in the draft. If I can get LeBron James by drafting Bronny James, you bet your ass I'm doing it. I feel bad for Bronny right off the top. All right, Jalen Brown, we know, is going to be in the slam dunk contest. But Chandler, are you buying that the fact that he's doing it will open up the doors for more superstars to enter? Yes, I think I think it just provides that spark. It, it, it kind of gets it back to what we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins, Vince Carter. We want to yes. see the best players in the dunk contest. Kudos, Jalen Brown, for getting that kick started. Kudos. We're going to take a quick break. We come back, wrap things up here on Run It Back. Run It Back. Run It Up. Run It Back. Run It Up. Run It Back. couple seconds left here we have aaron holiday on the show tomorrow of course the guy who was fouled what are you gonna ask him lou you first first question <laughs> what did he think about the call oh see i think i'm gonna ask him do you think you should have taken those free throws or offered the no, overtime you, listen on a, on a serious <laughs> note i'm gonna ask him what's it like for him and his brothers to be so successful in the league yes. and nobody ever talks yeah. about the holiday brothers Okay. Yeah, that's what I that's I want to know how those backyard how those backyard games were growing up. I want to know when they go home now for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yes. They get back there and play and compete. Uh that's what I want. And I want to know did Jalen Brunson really foul you there? Because that was bullshit. I should have won that. Yeah. Game. He knows. He knows. I always wanted to know like who gives the get the best gifts. Like it must be insane to have the whole family just be killer at basketball and be making money from it. Yeah, this will be fun. Timely. Timely guests for us to have on this week. Um, Chandler, I wish we could have gotten some of the behind the scenes of the Super Bowl festivities afterwards, but I know they're not suitable. No, you don't. You don't want to see Okay, that. fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> fine, but I Nobody really Nobody wants to see that. Uh, that does it for us today. We will be back tomorrow in the morning. Have a great night. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back like a running back. She's known all over the map because she make it clap.